uh, pulled me up by surprise. Anyway, but, but thank you very much. Honestly, it's been a great learning experience, um, my participation at, at the Ministry of Urban Futures Board, and also at all the conferences, just learning and listening to some of the incredible work that's gone on um, over the last um, 10 odd years. And I think, how can we support local action um, to address global challenges, to realize more just cities? And I think I've got kind of three takeaways um, to answer that question. And I think the first thing would be to really invest in building alliances, both at a horizontal uh, level um, and, and a vertical level. So it's building axes of solidarity um, amongst peers, amongst communities that are facing the same um, challenges in different contexts, but have a lot to learn from each other. I think in this morning, the example from Sheffield was really heartwarming. The fact that, that they said they learned a lot from going to South Africa and Nairobi. And, and this is, you know, we often, we often think of the global south as this place that needs to be learning from the global north. But for me, that was really a, a very significant um, um, thing to celebrate, actually, that Ministry of Urban Futures was able to do this. And I think it's not just investing in, in these forms of alliances and forms of solidarity. It's not just about thinking about the hard resources, like, you know, where is the money that will enable these things to happen? But it's also thinking about, equally so, the soft resources, how you build human connection, how people connect across different boundaries, across different regions, across different disciplines. And I think that um, what Beth said this morning about the relationships continuing even beyond Mr. Urban Futures, I think that's, that's where it's so critical. That's, that's what is, is so um, incredible about human connections and about, and about this kind of building relationships. Um, the second is, you know, and, and, and I'll some, uh, th there's been mention in the last session around it, is like this kind of developing a multilingualism. And I think that as um, academics, we are really not used to talking outside of the academic walls. But here we are trying to realize just cities. And what does that mean? That means that we need to be able to sit and listen and speak at, at a community level and understand and talk to them about what's going on and, and, and understand that language. But, but at the same time, understanding the language of the SDGs, um, of the global platforms, where we take the stories of the local and, and, and hope to use the, the language that, that those global platforms use to change the ways in which they address these questions of, of, of injustice and inequality in our cities. And I think that we need to understand the logics, the different logics of different audiences. So what kinds of languages do they respond to? What kinds of languages are, are what kinds of vocabularies are useful um, in different or amongst different audiences in order to draw their attention and, 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 and uh, generate action? And I think the third one, and this is me channeling my Brene Brown, um, if anyone knows Brene Brown, um, and it might sound a bit cheesy, but this is really that we need to dare to dream. Um, we need to be visionaries. Realizing just cities is not just something that, that is, um, you know, it, it's, it's something that we need to think that it can become a reality because that's what gives the, act the work that we're doing so much meaning. And, and here it's daring to dream at different levels. And it was, I, it was as a board member witnessing um, the diff how the different lips were daring to speak to each other, daring to think differently about their own cities, but also how they can learn from and, and, and contribute to, other, to, to changing <laughs> other cities. It was daring to dream uh, from the funding perspective because you, you don't put, it, it, this is not um, an easy enterprise to fund, um, you know, bringing in people from the lo global north and the global south um, across different disciplines. It's actually mad. And in fact, it's because it is mad, and I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure da David will tell us a lot about that, because it is mad, it's some, it's, it, it breaks all the paradigms, and it is 
in these spaces where we break out, where we dare to have courage, that we create something, um, innovations, and, and then we have this creativity. And I think it is the courage to show up um, without knowing how it will go, without being able to predict the outcomes that really is um, um, an, import an important outcome um, for these kinds of things. So, yeah. So thank you very much, Caroline. So we need to be brave, we need to dare. Um, I'm actually gonna pass to Vanessa. Uh, sorry, Vanessa. You, you joined us because the university's been having visioning days for, uh, all day today, so wasn't able to join all day. Um, but Vanessa is the Director of City and Culture Partnerships at the University of Sheffield um, and has agreed to come along and, and share your perspective on this question from the point of view um, of City Culture Partnerships. Um, thank you. Um, I apologise for not being able to come today, but I have been doing co-production in action, working with um, lots of people across the city about what they would like their city to look like in the next 10 years. Quite a big question. Um, we're in this amazing Cutler's Hall. We're surrounded by Ruskin quotes. So I shall start with Ruskin. There is no wealth but life. So to me, we, we're in my role in terms of city and culture, Sheffield is a city where the whole feeling of Ruskin comes together. It is a city that you cannot work in unless you do co-production. Um, so priorities can very much range. For, for our work with the university, for my personal work is global challenges, especially even in a city like Sheffield, is access to housing, access to education, access to transport. And one of those things that we're looking at in the city centre is how those can be the city itself can be the heartbeat of those three things. That people, regardless of whatever background or situation they come from, should have those human rights to be able to get around, work, live, operate. Um, and those questions about wealth are interesting because one of the questions that came up today is the higher and more improved we make the city centre, one of the people said it will bring in more beggars and everyone's answer around the table was, is, well, that's not a problem because then we'll just find ways to help those people, help that, you know, that it shouldn't be about denying people. So to me, wealth and life, uh, Ruskin goes back, the human essentials of what we as a citizen of Sheffield would expect our city centre to welcome, to be the sanctuary that it was, it is the first city of sanctuary in the UK, that is the basic human right we want for the people of Sheffield and for everyone who comes to Sheffield to have those basic elements. So that to me is what global challenges in a just city is, to enable the university to work with everybody in the city to bring that to fruition. I'm afraid I'm, I'm playing fast and loose with the order here um, because we've started a little bit late. I'm going to turn to you, Mark, um, from your position within Sheffield City Council. Um, you've been involved in the programme, um, but what's your perspective? And Sheffield's declared a climate emergency as well, and I know you've just been involved in the co-production at, at Pace Climate Session. So what's your perspective on how we can support local action to address global challenges and realise yeah, thank you, Beth. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I just want to thank everyone for, for coming to Sheffield and uh, just what a marvellous experience it's been today to hear all the different uh, lessons and to hear from different insights from different cities uh, and different countries around the world. I think just uh, reflecting on, on the question uh, and, and understanding how we can support local action to address global challenges uh, to realise just cities. From, from my perspective, um, and picking up on Beth's point, I'm particularly interested in how we, uh, how, how we focus on climate change, um, and in particular how we avoid the catastrophic impacts that were highlighted in the IPPC report that was released last October around uh, the, the changes that would be brought by one and a half degree temperature rise. Uh, Sheffield, uh, along with 220 or so other cities in the UK has, uh, has declared a climate emergency. And we've just had a, as, as Beth said, a very uh, immersive session on, on co-production at PACE. And it was a, it was a, very, uh, a, a very good session, very interesting. Uh, challenged some sort of thoughts around, around, what, uh, around that process and learning from other places. I think um, in, in one of the morning sessions, uh, David, uh, in, in the session before lunch, 
outlined how, how cities, their populations, their densities, the, the transport and, and the energy networks that are located within, within cities provide the ideal opportunity to drive decarbonisation uh, and outline that cities like New York are already leading the way in terms of uh, US approach and actually that's in a country that has opted out of the Paris Agreement. So in a sense that's about local action taking the lead about demonstrating to national government what needs to be done and, and, and taking control of that agenda. In, in a similar way, Sheffield, along with those other cities in the UK who have, have declared climate emergencies, are now working to become zero carbon. Uh, and we're working to become zero carbon by 2030, which is two decades ahead of our previous target and is also two decades ahead of the UK's government target. Uh, following on from that, we, uh, we, we've worked with the Tyndall Centre from Manchester, who've produced a science-based carbon budget for the city which uh, sets some uh, fairly, uh, f fairly challenging targets, and this will be the same for, for other cities uh, in the UK of a similar size, but we have a budget of 16 million tonnes, and we would need to reduce our carbon emissions by a rate of about 14% per annum uh, and remain within that budget if we are to, uh, to, to put forward our, our, our contribution as far as the, the Paris Agreement is, is concerned. Uh, the, the as, as, as a way of actually looking at how we can achieve that, the council also announced that it will convene a citizens' assembly, representing all parts of the city to guide that way forward in, and, and understand how we can become zero carbon. And I'll just very quickly try and reflect on some of the the messages and some of the the, the learning and some of the lessons that, have, that I've that I've heard today in the few sessions that I've attended. Of noting that there's been lots of other debate around the uh, ar around this building today. Uh, I think points that have been made already by, by some of the contributors here around continuing to build on our existing partnerships and collaborations, working with our two universities, a point that was made in an initial session around how we lever that knowledge, that experience that exists within our universities and actually apply that at the local level and use that uh, within the local authority. And again, something that Vanessa's outlined around the work that the university is supporting on and leading in terms of some of the work around the city, uh, developing the city that we, that we want to see, uh, utilizing the expertise that exists across the city in other, in other areas, not just the academic institutions, but also within our residents and communities, our businesses, uh, and other institutions in the third sector. And a point that was made before lunch uh, by uh, Joachim Nordquist, apologies if I've pronounced that slightly wrong, but. Um, I'm sure that, uh, he, he said that, I'm sh and it's something I think we'll all recognize, is that cities are not just single actors. Uh, we have lots of different influences, interests, and differences, and sometimes that can bring conflict. And I think reflecting on that in the afternoon session, um, I think that's one of the points around, it's gonna be particularly important around how we build that consensus, how we uh, work to build those coalitions, how we work across all levels of the city and no doubt, you know, that's, uh, I think we, we face some very difficult choices. Uh, Jez Hall referred to those earlier as, as, as these wicked problems that we have uh, and actually trying to understand how, how we can address some of those um, through, that, through that process. The, the council recognized in that February motion that, that climate change is the, the greatest social justice issue of the 21st century, particularly as it affects some of our poorest citizens in the city. And we want an approach that's inclusive, that represents our diverse communities, as, as Beth outlined in her in introductory speech at the, at the start of the conference. Uh, we also, I think, as well as recognizing that, that there's a lot that cities can be doing and there's a lot that can be done at the local level, we also all need to recognize the requirement and the role of government and that that will require other structural changes that we'll be needing to work to understand what some of those bigger infrastructure investment and the types of infrastructure that we're investing in, um, and the support of our other uh, industries of, of business supported by that long-term plan from government. I think a final point is just around the, the language and also just to understand whether the sustainable development goals can help us explore how we can change the narrative from one of, of cost and of, 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 of deficit, but also to something around what are the savings and what are the opportunities uh, particularly when we consider some of those wider benefits, 
around health, employment, and economic gains that come from investment in climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. Thank you, Mark. So, so we've heard from... Um, sorry. Uh, we've, we've heard from Caroline, um, someone who's been involved with Mr. Urban Futures for a long time as a member of the board. We've heard from Vanessa from the University of Sheffield and, and Mark, Chief Sheffield City Council, about some of what's going to happen in Sheffield moving forward. I'm going to turn to you, Orsa, as one of our main funders um, working for Mistra. Um, you know, you took a bold leap. We've said this all from the very beginning in funding this program. Um, given what you've heard today and the journey you've been on, what are your top priorities moving forward? Yes, uh, so I'm from Mistra, the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Environmental Research. And it's actually our purpose to fund uh, research of strategic importance uh, for a good living environment. Uh, and our statutes state that we should establish a research center uh, of high international quality. We should have interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary projects. We should encourage building new networks uh, and uh, uh, also uh, providing for societal benefits. So we have really good statutes to support uh, this kind of, of uh, research. Uh, and I think um, what we have learned, I think, from Mr. Urban Futures is uh, how you can develop uh, the co-creation process and, and actually be transdisciplinary, which we want all our programs to be. Uh, so I think we can take a lot of um, learning from, from uh, the, the center as it's been developing. Uh, I think uh, what we can do to support local action is to provide for opportunities for new research programs where you ac we actually have this long-term funding, which I think is really crucial for, for transdisciplinarity. Uh, and I think also that we should set up, as we talked about earlier, uh, expectations, that we have joint expectations with our research programs, uh, and that we follow up and require this, that uh, there should be transdisciplinarity for real. Uh, there should be respect for uh, different uh, competences and we should also encourage curiosity and patience and courage uh, within the uh, research program. So we need to be this, but we also need to more or less require this from our research programs that they should not be traditional in that sense. Uh, I think also that we probably need to engage and learn more from civil society. We have a lot of collaboration also with, with business uh, and uh, public, the public sphere, but civil society I think is a crucial actor that, that we might uh, engage with more. Uh, and this is something we learned from many of our research programs really. Uh, and one thing more is that we also need to be careful with uh, the management of our research programs. It's a really crucial part that you have a management that also support all of this and, and let uh, everybody be, be curious and, and uh, daring. So uh, thank you, David, and, and all of you others. Uh, today. Um, I'm going to ask David, as the um, director of Mr. Urban Futures, um, to reflect on this question, but also, David, given everything you've heard, you know, what next? Well, follow that. Um, <laughs> so let me start where also left off, and indeed where Caroline started us off, and that is um, the boldness, the originality, and crucially, the space, the time, and the resourcing to be experimental. Um, one of the most frustrating signs of our times is that our societies have become almost obsessively risk averse. And a consequence of that is what we all think of in different ways as uh, layers of bureaucratic compliance uh, whether that's in higher education, whether that's in local government, whether that's in, in um, the health professions or anywhere else. And even most extremely, I find it's true of research funders where you almost have to submit the final report of your project by way of the grant application. So what I'm getting around to saying 
is that having the opportunity to have a multi-year program like this with the flexibility to accommodate all the individual complexities and idiosyncrasies of up to seven such diverse cities around the world and giving us the space to do the experimentation. And of course, what is essential to experimentation is the risk of failure. There's a wonderful advert, those of you who live in the UK, that pops up on Classic FM from time to time about Edison having invented the incandescent light bulb. Now it's old technology several generations back, but it transformed the world. And how many such projects would be funded today if the funders knew that it took 3,000 failed experiments before he got the incandescent light bulb to work. It simply would never happen. So thank you to Mistra and thank you to CEDA and the consortium in Gothenburg and indeed all the other partners who funded individual projects which are sort of add-ons with the confidence that have enabled us to undertake the work that has been reported here today. Because of course there have been some elements that have been less successful than others. But over time and with iterations, improvements, I think you'll all agree that what we are doing and what we have achieved up to now has been truly world-leading and remarkable. And cities, like individuals, like academics, like local authorities, are highly competitive. So one of the values of working in one city in one country, or well, Sweden is actually two or three, is that they can learn from one another. And there's nothing like wow, that city is doing this, we want to do that too, to generate more action. The way we articulate between the local, the national, and the global, and back again, as we've illustrated at various stages today, also means that the global can reinforce the local action, the local can stimulate and push the national and the global. We've also used methodologies of co-production, transdisciplinary working in partnerships, which gives it more power and more influence than just a group of individuals who choose to collaborate in that way. But it also means we've had to address and overcome all sorts of institutional barriers and challenges, but we believe that the reward at the end of the day and the potential is thereby enhanced. We talk of sustainability as wicked problems, well, again, as we've discussed and confessed today, in some ways, co-production is a wicked process. That's not to say it should be avoided, it's not for everybody, but it's profoundly important. And to uh, quote the title of a classic book several decades ago, there is no shortcut to progress. And so it is by bringing on all the different stakeholders, addressing the human rights, as Vanessa said, ensuring that in the UN language today of the SDGs and Agenda 2030, no one is left behind and trying to give that substance and meaning that we can actually hope that we will all contribute in some small way to that major societal objective of sustainability. And as I said this morning, we cannot have sustainable cities in isolation from sustainable societies. And therefore, we all play a part, no matter how small or how large. And that challenge doesn't stop just because we've reached the end of 10 years of MISTRA funding. It's a challenge that all of us individually, in our, our families, in our communities, and in our cities will continue directly and indirectly to pursue.